You'll perish over and retrogrades. Today with me is a very special guest, a longtime friend of the show, one of the oldest friends of the show, Mr. Pat Dave Coffin, to catch up on all things Catholic and other what Catholic means universal, so it means all things. What's up, Patrick Coffin? How the heck are you? Everyone, everyone knows you. You neither need nor deserve any kind of introduction. Um, how the Fair how enough. How are you? I no, feel like I feel like Nancy Reagan. You said a very special episode of Rules for Retrograde. Don't do it? drugs. Drugs are bad. If you do drugs, you're bad. Okay. Nice to be here, sir. Congratulations on your fifty thousand. I have to say that like a monster truck announcer. Fifty thousand subscribers. Congrats. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I, I I felt a little bit like a kid with a giant kindergarten graduation party. But yeah, <laughs> you know, where I was like, everyone come congratulate me. I had people dropping in that had, mm -hmm. you know, 100,000 plus subs like yourself at one point. And I, it was a big, it's a big deal because like you, um, we tell 100% of the truth. And so to even hit 50 or even 100, a lot of channels, if you're making Mr. Beast wannabe videos, it's very easy to rip off that formula. But if you're telling 100% of the truth, especially the last five or 10%, it's like that stubborn five pounds, you really lose a lot, a lot of attrition there, a lot of difficulty mm -hmm. there. Um, people get mad there at the five or 10%. Um, that's where it's really difficult. And, you know, I, I said it then, I, I, I hate saying nice things about my friend, Pat Dave Coffin, but you're, you're one of the guys that um, is an exemplar for the younger generation of, of Catholic influencers. And by that, I don't mean myself. I'm kind of the middle generation at this point, but you were an influence. Yeah, and I just, it's, it's exemplary how I want to talk to you today about a little bit about the way the Catholic scene, has, online scene has changed, shifted around over the last year and a half or two years, because it's interesting. But first, I just want to say there are pole stars and some of the basics as to how to be a Catholic influencer, how to live and, and do as a Catholic influencer remain fixed, of course, being pole stars. And um, I just, yeah, I want to repeat what I said on that 50,000 show that uh, you're one of the guys that influence a lot of folks brought a lot of people into the faith from your Catholic answers days. So in all seriousness, thanks for um, the example you've provided for the young Catholic influencers. Well, thank you, Tim. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, nonplussed. Did I just employ that word properly? Um, I, I didn't set out to be anything except find a way to pay bills and feed my my family, but I found that it's, there's a, there's a simple, but not easy path. And that's just to commit to yourself and to, to the Lord, just to tell the truth. Yeah. And I know it sounds, it sounds cliche because it's so, there's nothing to adorn that, uh, just tell the truth. And when you tell the truth, as far as the online Catholic space or any space online, you were up against one of the three, uh, enemies that scripture and, the church give us uh, as our mortal enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Uh, on the online space is the world. You're, you are in the world. Yeah, big tech, Silicon Valley, that, those are worldly people. They think worldly thoughts. They are anti-supernatural. They are anti-truth as far as that goes. Anti-Christ, if you want to go um, Aristotelian Thomas, that Christ is the truth. The, the ontology of the truth is not complicated. It's easy to... To memorize you don't have to catch up with any lies just let your hair down and tell it the way you see it and uh for the last 10 11 years now since so oh i don't know march 2013 we've had a, a bit of an upside down catholic church where old verities and what we used to think of as pillars uh, you know kind of substructural supports those are all gone and now a lot of people i uh, feel like they're on their own which is why i like your subtitle you're you're the handle that you use, uh, parish orphans. Uh, a lot of people feel this, that they've been somehow abandoned or that the, the terra firma beneath their feet has been, uh, has been swept away. And I think the, um, the trans chaos at St. Patrick's, Patrick's Cathedral is exhibit A of that sense of chaos. And um, it, there's a temptation there to, to take the black pill 
And I refuse to take the black pill because that's just another word for despair. Red pill is great. In fact, I'm just finishing um, an ebook called Beyond Red and Blue, The Seven Pills of Life. And I've been thinking a lot about the difference between the red pill and the black pill. And if you'll notice, um, there's an effort now to redefine red pill as black pill because the, the people that run big tech and the people that want to try to control the narrative of online or, or elsewhere at discourse, they don't like the idea that people are waking up. Look at, look at Russell Brand, right? Sex addict, drug addict, alcoholic, kind of train wreck celebrity, slowly began to be um, uh, in line with the truth. And now he's like reading scripture and, and uh, participating in Lent and praying the rosary. Uh, I call Russell an, an outsider insider. And so the people that that have the power to delete people like Russell Brand or Tim Gordon or anyone who's interested in the truth, um, they don't want that great awakening. So they redefine the red pill as the black pill, and that's a bad thing. Um, there's a whole bunch of devil terms that they use. Uh, one that comes to mind is uh, white nationalism. I, I, I don't know what that is. Uh, I have no interest whatsoever in, in skin color. Uh, I'm a Catholic. If skin color is all you have, brother, you don't have very much. But white nationalism, Christian nationalism, this becomes a devil term what, that is used to, to stop debate and to, to, to prevent people from having conversations. So yeah, the, to, in sum, just tell the truth. And don't, don't look over your shoulder to see what your tribe is doing. Because uh, sometimes tribal leaders whether they're Catholic influencers or whatever, they're also beholden to interests we don't know about. And usually it comes down to donor phobia. Yeah. If you have donor phobia, you might as well quit because now you've got a self-imposed leash and um, not very retrograde to have a self-imposed leash. And well, but it depends what people's motives are, which are also invisible. If you're in this space and your motivant, your primary motivant anyway, is making moolah, then you can have the worst intent in the world and to say, get, get out of it or don't even start doesn't really apply because if someone has bad motives and they're willing to become a captive creator, there's a term mm -hmm. you throw around you, you got that from somewhere else. Then yeah, you don't need to get out of the game. If you're willing to be a shill or a sellout, which too many people in this space are, I guess they're in the right spot for, for them. They're not going to feel too well come judgment day. And they're not retrograde. They're not, uh, they're not following in the footsteps of guys like you or Jesse and Terry. But they're, you know, their means befits their end. Well, it's easy to, to pretend that you're a pioneer and that you're doing all the nerve-hitting heavy lifting when you're not. You're just catching up with what your own audience is telling you that they want to hear. Yep. And then it's easy to succumb to, to clickbaitism. Uh, I'm not opposed to making money online, by the way. I don't, I don't think it's wrong for Catholics to make money online. Of course not. Uh, of course we not. all have bills. And so I'm, I'm not, um, not anti-profit, but I am anti-deception. Um, I could be wrong about something. I'm, this is one of the great uh, features of being a Catholic is that it's not about me. I don't have to be Martin Luther. I don't have to be the inventor of all things. I can be corrected. Um, I need course correction from outside myself. And that's why I'm grateful that I'm a Catholic. Right. Um, but um, while I might be wrong, I'm not going to lie. And yeah. that, that just, it comes through. It comes through, Tim. You can tell through body language. You can tell through tone of voice. Um, I remember reading, it was a, I, I think it was in the Catholic Digest. Remember that used to come every month? It was like a Reader's Digest. I do. Yeah. Back in the back in the day. This is I back before it. back when your parents just first met, you know, back in the eighties. Uh and it was an anecdote about Bishop Sheen. And one one night after filming It's uh Life is Worth Living, he slipped into a little divey place in Manhattan, a uh, little diner, and uh people recognized him because he had his clerics on as he always did. And so um the nun who recounts this, because she was there as well. Um, he, a little crowd gathered around his booth and he started talking about show prep and he, was, he did a kind of an impromptu Q&A in this restaurant in New York City. This is back in, this would be mid-1950s. And um, they, were, they were complimenting him on his, his speaking ability. And he said that uh, anecdotally, he said only about 7% of what I say is remembered a month later. 
And that stuck, I don't know why it stuck with me, 7%. I thought, well, come on, this content's so great. And then I read a book by Dorothy Sarnoff. Dorothy Sarnoff starred on Broadway as the original Mrs. Chang opposite Yul Brynner in The King and I. And uh, she wrote a book called Never Be Nervous Again. It's on public speaking. And Dorothy Sarnoff is credited with teaching Ronald Reagan how to use a teleprompter properly. Mm. And she did all this research on the impact that speakers have on, on audiences. And she said, well, the research indicates that a month later after a talk, the audience only remembers about 7% of the content. I thought that's what Bishop Sheen said. So what is remembered if it's not content? You're remembered. Do you believe your own message? Are you comfortable talking about the things you say you're committed to? Those are the things that make an impression. Remember the, the, the Kennedy and Nixon TV debates in 1960? Mm -hmm. I wasn't uh, there, but... Uh, that was I the year your great-grandparents met. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Nixon had a cold that day, and he was a little bit um, uh, not clean-shaven. Uh, he was a little bit sweaty. But Nixon was a brilliant man. He, he forgot more about foreign policy than John Kennedy at the time, who was a senator, had, had learned. And yeah. so the people in the studio figured, or on, who listened to it, figured that uh, Nixon trounced Kennedy. But on, on camera, Kennedy would look tan, relaxed, and ready. He looked like, um, you know, kind of a, had a feline uh, confidence to him on television. And we meow. Had that, that election yeah. 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 Chairman Meow. Chairman Meow. So the medium is the message. Right. And um, we could go into Marshall McLuhan and what medium is the message means and how that fits into evangelization. Well, um, I just want to say, yeah. I, well, some guys are much, much, much more comfortable on radio than in front of a camera. And it's true. It, the medium's the message. That's, that's the famous Nixon paradigm from that debate. But what I, one thing that fits in that I wanted to ask you about and again, you, this is just how natural. It's actually two things, two developments from the last time that that we've spoken. Mm -hmm. The first one, have you noticed, this isn't a, a, a wrong right question, it's just something that I, I've noticed and maybe I'm just, my algorithms in Twitter and YouTube are stacked or have changed. Have you noticed in, in light of all this stuff that, you know, the, the, the person's authenticity or not is really what will be remembered, not the flavor of the month thing that kind, kind of everyone's saying flavor of the month things. They're either sincere about it or not. Have you noticed in the last 18 to 24 months what's happened in the, the Catholic social media space, specifically that there's been this post-trad movement and we won't talk about what the etiology is and who's wrong, who's right, you know, who caused it. But there's this, I think, really abysmal post-trad response where the hip new thing to say is it's based and red-pilled to just be the normiest Catholic imaginable. And you have people that are not normies in other dimensions and categories of life saying the best Pope of all time is Pope Francis and the best ecumenical council of all time and the most faithful is Vatican II. And things have gotten so much better with the last six popes over the last 60 years in the church. And you're like, what, what is going on? Have you noticed this? Or is this just my algorithm has populated my Twitter timeline with nut jobs? Very good question. Um, I have noticed that. And I think it's an attempt at, um, at safety. We, we say norm, normies, but norm, norm is short for normal, right? People want normalcy. And when you have a sustained set of affairs that is not normal, that feels chaotic, it feels dark, it feels confusing, with a lot of weaponized ambiguity, you, you cling for something that feels safe, like a, a rock in a storm. Whether it's the temptation the trads feel toward the SSPX, or the temptation low information Catholics feel toward the Medjugorje movement, they yeah. both offer a kind of promise of certainty amidst the storm of chaos. And I, th I think they're, they're mistaken missteps. So I think the, the desire to say that the greatest Pope ever is this one and the, the, the greatest and, and maybe the only ecumenical council since the Council of Jerusalem and that's mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles is Vatican II. I think it's, um, I think it's an attempt to keep your head in the sand. But and, what, what uh, this move... This pushback is comprised of guys that are not normies, 
I'm talking even guys like EMJ, or admirable minds, who is just just attacking me for just basically liking the Latin Mass. I was never a guy. I've never set foot in an SSPX chapel. Pe people kind of know that. I, I don't. I definitely don't hate those guys, but I'm not that. And he's saying anyone who says Novus Ordo is um, either a schismatic or on their way out the door. There's a lot of folks that that look up to him that are young Zoomers that comprise this crowd I'm talking about. And they're not normies. They have very, very nuanced positions on, you know, the Old Testament, let's say, and on, mm -hmm. I don't know, whatever, race relations in America. So they're not, they're willing to be brave and they're willing to say, hey, the truth or nothing. But then it comes to the Catholic faith and they take this, I guess it comes down to papal maximalism. If you believe Francis is the Pope and you're in a papal maximalist, I mean, I, I do believe Francis is the Pope still more than not. But if you're a papal maximalist, I guess you're forced, you painted yourself into what Dennis Miller calls an irrevocable moral corner where you have to, as a maximalist, say, this is the new normal. I, I think that's that's how I've explained this post-trad movement that really rose up about 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, the term Novus Ordo, Novus Ordo Misse, the or, new order of the mass that comes from the magisterium. Uh, we're permitted to say it. It doesn't suggest that someone else is a second-class citizen. Um, but I also believe in hierarchy, and I believe it's obvious that no one wanted the Novus Ordo Missae, except for a cabal of quasi-Masonic uh, red hats under Paul VI. And it was imposed from above. It was experimented, and after after 65 was over, and the council uh, let loose with all its explos explosive chaos, um, first in the Sistine Chapel, I believe, in 1968, and then it was... Um, unfurled to the world, this uh, new mass that no one clamored for. No one clamored for. Just, I know this is a bit of a sidebar, but communion in the hand was voted on in the Vatican II. 80% thumbs down. Absolutely not. Right. They saw, even crazy, loopy Vatican II bishops, they saw where that spear was going to land. It was going to land in massive loss of faith um, to receive Holy Communion that way. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I think everyone's trying to pick their battles and try to trying to figure out what their lane is and only heaven's perfect. Yeah. One, the, the same people that would condemn me, little old me, who two, three years ago, people were trying to call a, a post-trad just because I refused to, to fit. I'm like, look, I don't want to go to an SSPX chapel, and I, I will go to Nova Zordo Mises um, to, uh, begrudgingly, but I'm also just lazy. I don't I don't want to drive to New Orleans or Bay St. Louis, each, each about equidistant, about you know, hundred minute drive every Sunday. I'm not going to do that. I'm just, I'm just like, I'll just go to the, I'll go to a, a crummy Novus Ordo if I have to, but there's no question in my mind. I would bet everything I own that if we had God, you know, at the, at our particular judgment in front of us and we said, what, what's more reverent, the Novus Ordo or the TOL, TLM, you'd say, uh, this is a serious question. This isn't a serious question. Next, obviously, it's the latter. Mm -hmm. And don't don't ask me something so silly again. So if I'm just having held forth, go to Latin Mass where you can. People who go to the Novus Ordo are as much Catholic. I've always made this analogy. It's it's like you split up with your family at the theater for the day. Two, two of you see one movie, two of you see the other. And, you know, the A group lucked into seeing a really good film and the B group saw a really crappy film it's like that or, or, uh, the same, no, or the same film in black and white or yeah the same film in black and white to take that but but somehow remove merit from the part of the viewer and just say everyone kind of wishes they saw the better film but there's no merit in the viewer that doesn't mean there's not more merit in the better film that that's I, mm -hmm. i've said this for four years i think i started saying this on taylor marshall's channel so i am the last guy to be, ever have approached condemning Novus Ordo Catholics, I'm saying this seems to be part of the um, architectonic or the, the teleology involved by what they did during and after Vatican II. So if I'm getting called an extremist, this is my whole point. Wow, I, that that's weird. Because a lot of the, the trad Catholics are like, Tim should be more SSPX adjacent. Um you now fit into this. I, whenever I hear your name out of one of these post-trads mouths, 
they they don't call you if, if it's bad for me and i still think more than 50 50 francis is pope then it's it's bad for you they they just they call you an outright set of a contest because of your position and i say well, well technically that's right insofar as technically we're all set of a contest every time we have an interregnum between popes mm -hmm. and and really and then i have to i've had to explain to these zoomer trad catholics lots of whom are are not normies in their categories across the the political and cultural spectrum outside of catholicism I say, look, set of a contest is a historical term, historiographical term. It means there hasn't been a pope or a real council since after 1958. If you call someone that thinks there's this snafu a set of a contest, it's really misleading to anyone who has an understanding of history, even though it might be technically right. How have you been situated from your own perspective with this new post-trad group? Uh, excellent question. Uh, I haven't really given it any thought. I just have so committed myself to not turning my my head to the left or, the, or to the right. Um, it doesn't mean all my positions are correct. It just means that as soon as I start listening to what people say of me, I will I will begin to have that that self imposed leash, and I just want I know. to see things clearly. Um, I know, but yeah, I, th you're right. Yeah. You just made my case about the state of a contest. And by the way, they don't call me a state of a contest. They call me a state of a contest. Yes, it's a kind of visceral thing about it um and it's like proving you're not a racist proving you're not an anti-semite proving you're not an islamophobe proving you're not a homophobe the more you say that you're not right they go i see what you're doing there you're denying it right so as soon as you say i'm not a racist or whatever the or the ism is that's being thrown at you then uh you've kind of lost the argument so i've just stopped defending myself if you want to think i'm a state of a contest then go ahead I think the evidence is clear that you can't be Pope if someone else is Pope. And the Declaratio read and written in hand over two weeks on his walnut desk by Pope Benedict XVI does not include the phrase that needs to be included according to Canon 332.2 and elsewhere in Canon law. So he remained Pope. That's my position. Uh, even if that position is dead wrong, I am trying to encourage a public conversation in the church about it so we can hash it all out and talk it through like adults. Discourse, logos, order, the, debate. The Catholics only... love debate, except when it comes to certain things. Mm -hmm. Certain topics are verboten, and they don't want they don't want to be called bad names. And this, the Sadie name just makes me grin now. The only thing I'm confident, like certain, you're wrong about. You've been wrong about since this. I, I don't know as to the disposition of the the big question. Well, I, I still favor the view that maybe somehow he's pope. But what you were wrong about, I think, when you first came out mm -hmm. as a Beneplanist or Benevacontist or whatever, was when you said that in the evid evidentiary uh, scale mongering, what Francis has actually done in the chair has no bearing. Uh, I'm like, that's actually not right. It, uh, and, and you're actually occluding some evidence that would weigh in the favor of your your point of view i think i think if you do i've looked at this a little bit more over the last year mm -hmm. and i'm i'm not a beneplanist but i think you're kind of ignoring some strong evidence and other times over the last year or year and a half more recently i think i i've heard you sort of come around on that point like fruit of fruit of the I'm poison to understand tree. what you mean what do you mean if a pope if someone who's a claimant to the pontificate, we never really know until afterwards, by the way. You never know for certain until afterwards because pontificates, by virtue of the fact that pontificates people out there, are only invalidated afterwards. Mm -hmm. So so there is a kind of ex post um, retroactive verification that's always at work with every single one of the 266 popes. And I, I believe Francis is probably, probably more likely than not pope. But... What I'm saying is, you were saying when you first came out, like, hey, this has nothing to do with the badness of his pontificate, assuming that it's real. This has to do only with, you know, the vow, the way it was taken, and you were likening it to um, to an annulment process or a declaration yeah. of nullity. I'm yeah, like, that, 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 dispositionally, that, that's true. The disposition of the case is true, but the fruit of the tree also mm -hmm. helps to tell it. And so evidentiarily... I, I don't think that's true. I think the case 
your case is actually strengthened, bored by, well, look at all the, the, the bad fruits. And no, Tim, I'm really glad you're bringing this up. Um, you and I almost got into this when you had me on the show, what, a year and a half ago. You, except for a conversation I had with John Henry Weston about it, it wasn't really a debate. You were the only Catholic host that wanted to debate me on this. Everyone else was satisfied using uh, devil terms. So I credit you for opening the door so that conversation could be had. And it was, you can maybe put the link up. I thought it was a very um, um, robust exchange. And yeah. everyone comes to evidence drop by drop. Very few people get whole cloth, everything they've always wanted to know about X and, and it arrives in one moment. And so I've had, I've been on a journey to discover more and more facts. I've read more books. I've read more canon law. I've read more history. And I never meant to suggest that, that nothing that Bergoglio does has anything to do with the evidence. Of course, that what has happened to the Catholic Church under him since March 2013 is confirmatory evidence. It's not probative, but it confirms an awful lot. Right. So when people say, did, did you see what he did today? Oh my God, I just, I just say, what do you expect? You, do you expect me to regard him as a man protected by the Holy Spirit? the man who has rejected the title Vicar of Christ, who has allied himself with every enemy of all previous popes, who has praised abortionists, who has uh, uh, at least at a bare minimum propounded material heresy in Amoris Laetitia by saying that divorce from remarried, civilly remarried Catholics without a decree of nullity can receive Holy Communion. That's official Catholic teaching under this guy since 2015. But, I mean, it's a long, it's the beginning of a long list. I think that confirms the thesis that Pope Benedict erected an impeded sea to save the church because what he could not fix, he featured. Yeah. So, yeah, I, th I think you're right. I think, look, wait till the gay German synod on gay German, German synodality comes out. I think that document's going to make Amoris Laetitia look like Pius the twelfth, Pius the tenth. Yeah. And it's going to get worse. You notice, it, is it imaginable? Is it imaginable that this atheist, trans prostitute fiasco in St. Patrick's Cathedral, formerly called America's Parish, where Bishop Sheen, Venerable Bishop Sheen, preached every Sunday. That this could have possibly happened under Pope Benedict or John Paul II or Paul VI or Pius XII? Absolutely unimaginable. And yeah. Cardinal Dolan will not receive any, there will be no punishment. He knows it. This quiet mass of reparation, give me a break. Too little, too late. That's like bishops out here in California who wearing 19 masks showed up at a St. Junipero Serra statue and threw some holy water at it after some goons attacked it. Where were the Catholic men surrounding the statue saying, not on my watch, I dare you, touch the statue. Yeah. Too little, too late. So yeah, I th this is why I say that St. Patrick's is the parish that Bergoglio built. He created the ethos where chaos is allowed to be, um, to run riot and to confuse people. And uh, I, the, the priest, there'll be no punishments here. There's no, there's no reckoning on this. Of course not. Of course not. I would, you're hitting a lot of points. I, I would just, I would take a minute and, and tell people, you know, we're now at 50,000 subscribers, like subscribe, hit the notification bell, support us on locals and subscribe star. We, we, we need it. We always need the support. And that I, I would make, I would take Pat's last clip and I would say, this is what sets this channel apart from others. I, I even, if I glance for a half second at the chat, when you're going on a list, a catalog of the crimes of Francis and you're getting ahead of steam the way you just were, people are like, oh, would you push back? This has to be a debate. I'm like, Not everything's a debate. I, when I know, I know. And I'll go and debate people when I know. I'm certain atheism is incorrect. I'm certain Christianity is correct, so I'll debate against a, a Muslim or a Jew. It's the correct monotheism. It can be proven categorically. I'm certain Catholicism will triumph over Protestantism. I go and do these debates. I, I All I can do is tell you, people out there, parish orphans, retrogrades, when something is up for debate, I'll debate it. When something's not yet up for debate, when something's just up for consideration, like, huh, I wonder what it means that this is the by far the worst pope we've ever had. 
I say that and I mean it. And when I say, um, you know, I'm still a little more convinced than not that Francis is Pope, I mean it. So what, why would I, this is why you come to this channel, by the way, this is my, the, the point in my connection. I'm not going to stop a guy who's making good points. Sometimes good points only go 45% of the way. Pat's making good points. You're making good points, Pat, I should say, which accrue on that other side. Now, this isn't a debate channel, and people get mad if I just say, huh, that's interesting. This, I'm, not, I'm not uncertain about a lot of things, but this is one of those things that can only be known ex post facto for certain, and especially given the man, Pope Francis. I, I've also said this very, very frequently about all the evidence you just deduced. It would be so much cleaner crisper, simpler, more um, remedy-friendly for the history of the magisterium, the future history of the Roman Catholic magisterium, if you're right. And I'm and and me and the people who have called Pope Francis Pope are wrong. Now, that doesn't make, that's wishful thinking. That doesn't make it so. But do you, do you understand why someone like me who's just being honest, mm -hmm. I don't even think I debated you when you came out. I was just like, well, we can talk about it because this is something... I'm not sure you're wrong, but I'm going to err on the other side. It's a kind of Pascalian wager I'm making vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis the pontificate. I, I don't ever think I even had enough chutzpah on this issue because Francis is so bad. Say I know you're wrong. I I think I said from the very beginning, ab initio, I hope you're right. Do you understand why I would say that? I totally understand why you'd say that. And I, I, as I don't I was know what it means to... if you're wrong. Yeah, I, I mean, no, I don't I get know it. what it means if you're wrong. I do get it. As I was coming to what I call the finish line or the kill shot, because my, the first half of my research had to do with the canonical crimes of the St. Gallen Mafia, which are now a matter of public record. Yeah. And I would recommend, I wanna throw attention at Julia Maloney's book on the St. Gallen Mafia. It's a very good snapshot at the, the bio background and the way that uh, the St. Gallen Mafia Cardinals operate. So Bastrini, the late Cormac Murphy O'Connor, um, Martini, um, Walter Casper, uh, that crew, they're, they're the ones, according to Austin Ivory, the biggest bootlicker on earth of Bergoglio. Team, the guy who coined the phrase Team Bergoglio, he wrote in his book, The Great Reformer in 2014, barely a year after Bergoglio arrives from Buenos Aires, that they schmoozed him, that they, they brought him to dinner, that they, they vote blocked and they collaborated in a kind of a clandestine way. <clears throat> the only problem is his former boss, Cormac Murphy O'Connor, May he rest in peace. He was uh, accused uh, multiple times of being uh, a cover upper of predator priests and as well as a, uh, an accused abuser himself. By the way, it was Cormac Murphy O'Connor's um, uh, assistance in getting Bergoglio elected that induced a secretary to pull Cardinal Mueller off the altar in the middle of mass at the chapel at the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, before they changed the name of that too, right? Yeah. Basically, keep your hands off of uh, Cormac Murphy O'Connor. Drop, drop your investigation. That's, right. how, that's how Cardinal Mueller was treated. Um, I asked Cardinal Burke about this on my podcast about three years ago, Your Eminence, because I had just discovered University Dominici Gregis. This is the 1996 Apostolic Constitution, most probably written by then Cardinal Ratzinger with the signature of John Paul II. And it is a manual of canonical um, prescriptions and prescriptions regarding the rules that will govern future conclaves. And in 79 through 81, I keep saying, please don't believe Patrick Coffin. My opinion is worthless, but at least follow the documents of the church. An apostolic constitution is the second highest canonical uh, authoritative document in the Catholic church, short of a defined dogma. And in Numbers 79 through 81 of University Dominici Gregis, there are behaviors that if the cardinal electors and the one who assents to this, if they indulge in these behaviors, and it's the very behaviors that are bragged about by Austin Ivory, which is why his former boss demanded that that book be excised, the chapter be excised. The chapter is called Conclave. You have the original. The other I first found, I, I went to A Books. I finally found a tract down the original um, unexpurgated version of that book. And it's very clear that this behavior, if you line it up with numbers 79 through 81 of University Dominici Gregis, 
it's describing canonical crimes. And the punishment for those crimes is automatic latte sententia excommunication. I didn't write that. Pope John Paul II wrote that. I remember. So I asked Cardinal Burke about this. This is the, right one of the, the greatest canonists in the last hundred years, the former uh, prefect of the apostolic signature. Yeah. Is it possibly remnants that these crimes invalidated that conclave? His answer was, it is possible, but it becomes difficult to prove. I'm summarizing now. It becomes difficult to prove because the, the cardinals that would sit in a, a canonical forum or trial would partly, uh, would there be overlap with the ones who are the perpetrators? So you see the problem, the fox watching the hen house. So then my, then my investigations began tilting toward the Declaratio that Pope Benedict read on uh, February 11, 2013. Itself is misnamed. It should have been called the Renunciatio. It's not. There's so many different hints that the late Holy Father dropped that he was creating an impeded see by appearing to withdraw. He certainly withdrew from public life, and he did, he did resign the ministerium. But according to the canon 332.2, he does not resign the office. He does not resign the juridical object of being the Pope, which helps explain why he continued to wear the white cassock, the white zucchetto, why he signed his name Benedict XVIPP, Pro Pontifex, why he gave the apostolic blessing in person and in writing. Uh, my, so my next, that, that was my next, uh, my next stop, if you will. And it's only because I think that is upstream from the con canonical crimes of the conclave, which I think themselves are clear and obvious, pardon me, and publicly bragged about. It's not just the Austin Avery book. It's also Uncle Ted McCarrick's 2013 speech at Villanova, which as you can see on YouTube. And it's also in the biography of Gottfried Daniels, the homosexualist pro-abortion cardinal of Antwerp, who slowly destroyed the church there over, over 30 years. And by the way, it was Daniels. Now, Daniels, may he rest in peace, was, was caught on audio pressuring the sex abuse victim of a bishop in Belgium, encouraging this kid to keep his who's, mouth shut. Whose uncle it was. It, it was whose who's biological that. uncle it was. Over Bergoglio's left shoulder in the, the evening of March 13, 2013, that Logia photo op includes Daniels. Yeah. People uh, no, on this channel, people, listeners know these these marshaled facts well because these are of record. Um, there's no yeah. way to make them nice. So my, my next, I'm going to be doing a print interview with uh, an Italian art historian and researcher named Andrea Cianci. Cianci wrote a, a book that's now a bestseller in Italy called The Ratzinger Code. Yep. And he analyzed everything that Pope Benedict said from March 2013, actually February with his, remember the weird time gap on the 11th, he says that his last day will be the 28th. Uh, yeah. Unlike President Nixon, who resigned that day, and he resigned the office. You can, you can see the PDF on, online, the letter he wrote to then Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. I resigned the office of the presidency. Okay, boom, now you're, you're no longer president. But Benedict did not do that. So um, let me ask you this, Tim, just as a thought experiment. If you were a groomsman at a wedding and the wedding arrives, the wedding day gets there and the opening prayers are given and the bride has not walked through the, the main door yet. And you notice, cause you're standing two feet from the guy that the, dr the groom is drunk, All right? He's not falling down, but he's obviously inebriated. He goes through it, stumbles through his vows, the confetti flies, the, you know, there's a reception. Now you're standing there in the corner, sipping your cold beverage. You realize he's not married validly. True or false? Uh, depending on his culpable mens rea, which, which, you know, some people operate better under there. It's, it's a very similar. No, I, mean, I realize I, I, that I don't mean, according to the I don't normal mean, epistemic don't, categories. Yeah. Let me add one more finesse. A good chance mean, he's not married. Yeah, I don't mean wine gladdens the heart and let's, let's raise a glass to the glory of God and nature. I mean drunk. I mean slurring his speech. That's not Yeah, but he marriage. still could have meant it. I mean, this is why I'm not, I'm not just trying to bust your thought experiment, you know, your, mm -hmm. your, your trolley car problem here. Literally, he might be married. It, it, there's a difference between voidable and void. 
Um, but assuming that he really, well, let's say he's actually inebriated, that might make in situ in thought experiment one, mm -hmm. he has an unhappy marriage and five years later, four years later, his bride wants to go and um, enforce the voidability of the, the contract, the sacrament, mm -hmm. then she can. Or thought experiment B, he shouldn't have gotten drunk that day, but he's very happily married and they never want to enforce the voidability. Void, voidable doesn't mean void, uh, as we say in the law. There's, they're two mm -hmm. different legal statuses. Okay. So, um, yeah, maybe it was voidable, but they never go through. And, and actually, there's also C. Maybe he just, maybe he's Irish and the stuff is milk to him and it's fine. And no one really but God can judge the dueling epi epistemic statuses of people that are drunk or have what would be mm -hmm. diminished capacity, culpable mens rea, diminished to the point where is it here or is it here? And how do we even quantify someone's mens rea? They're, they're... Okay, that's this is good. That's a very good um, devil's advocate objection. I, I never thought about that. I would add one more condition, and that is that him being drunk that day ends up being a revelation that he was he was an alcoholic. He was completely addicted, and it was kind of subsurface. But showing up drunk on his wedding day was like the the deciding revelation that he has a problem. Um, and if and, and you could additionally add that they never consummated their marriage. The point is, the I'm not trying to just be a douche. Yeah. Yeah, no, make the point. I'm, I'm I have, accepting I your objection, to this. Tim. Yeah. This is we're sifting things out, and I think it's a very good objection. All I'm saying is the doubt rises to such a level yes. that it becomes an elephant in the room that you have to talk about and at least have the conversation. I agree. And and work it through with the couple. So I thought it's my I, can, yeah. yeah, sorry. One, one last one last horse out of the barn. Do I'm it. not the final authority. Yeah. I'm a curious person with a laptop. It's the right. cardinals who were appointed by John Paul II and Benedict that have to sort this out. We have had an imperfect synod called the Council of Sutri thousand years ago. The wiki page on the Council of Sutri is very interesting, S-U-T-R-I. And during the Avignon papacy, an unlettered woman from Siena named Catherine publicly corrected the great Father Vincent Farrar, who was a Dominican, he's now a saint. Yeah. He was encouraging all of Europe to follow anti-pope. He didn't think that at the time, of course. He was convinced that Clement VII was the pope. He wasn't, he was an anti-pope. Right, right. And so he you didn't have acknowledge Urban the sixth. Right. He did acknowledge Urban the Sixth in Rome, and she was right, and he was wrong, and he acknowledged it, and he changed the guy's name in the Teijator of the Mass. Okay, so, so this I just is my... want the conversation. The conversation is the thing I want, and you're we're having it. So when these post trads, no, this I, I I love to hear you say this. When these post trads say, "Oh, Patrick Coffin is a set of a contest," I, I don't even know how I figure in badly because I've I've hedged my bets enough on this one issue because because that's where my heart is. But I'm like, let's say there's a thirty eight percent chance. I, I don't know how you quantify that Francis is an anti-pope. I'm still like, I'm, I'm more than 51%. So I'll call him that um, Pope, but let's, let's live these thought experiments out. I'll, I'll do this with these post trads. Occasionally I'll indulge them. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the, uh, um, the meme. Have you ever had, how would you feel if you didn't have breakfast this morning <laughs> with different people? And some people can't think through, the hypo and they're like but i did have breakfast this morning. But, yeah, but how would you feel if you didn't that's all i'm trying to get people to do and i think you you have a more crystallized position on the matter but i think that's all you're trying to do too because i go look if pat coffin is right then it changes much yes they're like he's not though i'm like okay how would you feel if you didn't have breakfast this morning remember that we're we're, we're setting our epistemic frame here Setting frame is the red pill guys call it. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and you guys just, your head explodes, but let's let's go through and we say, okay, now let's say Patrick Coffin's wrong. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, that well, that's what it is. I'm like, I, I know, it's just a hypo, bro. It's just a hypo. Okay, so let's say you're right and Patrick Coffin's wrong. Then they're usually quick to, in a not much camouflaged uh, mien, say, he's going to hell. I'm like, no. So there's, it's not just St. Vincent Ferris. There are other saints that during, I, I forget who they are, the Avignon papacy were saluting the wrong guy in Rome. What does that mm -hmm. prove you? It's a, it's a, a rule proving exception that literally if, if you're, 
Culpable mens rea applies not only to um, the divorced and civilly remarried as Francis wants or um, an SS couple who wants to have a union blessed or murderer. It does. Culpable mens rea also can get people like St. Vincent Ferrers or maybe Patrick Coffin off the hook. And then I, I say, okay, so if you're right and Patrick Coffin's wrong, you know, as long as he's being sincere, he's still good, right? And they, they don't like that. Um, even though these are the, the Francis defenders who have defended Francis saying that culpable mens rea can get anyone off the hook, even really, really bad guys. So I say, okay, so, so take that and cogitate on it. And they won't because they don't cogitate much. It's a pros hen equivocal usage of the term when you talk about some of these people thinking. But what I also say is, okay, Pat can do this in reverse. Like m my thought experiment to you is, and I don't I don't mean your own soteriology. I, I think you you presented the rule proving exception. You're probably a little more worried about your salvation if you've been calling the wrong guy Pope, but you've also expressed enough doubt. You just kind of did it to prove your authenticity. But what of the church if you're wrong? Because this is where I live every day. What if Pat Coffin is wrong? Pope Francis is authentic Pope number 266. What of the remedial course for the church? Because one thing I'm certain about is he's done all this evil for the church and he's contradicted church teaching in at least a dozen ways. What do you say then? And just I just want you to show everyone you can reason. You know how you, you might be able to fathom how you'd feel if you didn't have breakfast this morning. Well, what, what's the remedial course for the church if you're wrong? I don't know how I could be proven wrong, but if there was some preternatural event where it was made manifest that he's the legitimate certified but bad pope i guess i would say some version of whoops i hope no one was scandalized no but uh, i mean but for I'm the not, church not by you scandalized by him i because he, he's yeah well tim you're you're talking about an I, in my very humble opinion an unsquareable circle you can't square the circle but the Vicar of Christ, hold on a second. He doesn't want the title Vicar of Christ. That was removed from the Annuario Secretary of State yearbook in 2020. He doesn't want to be called uh, Vicar of Christ. Have you seen the um, strange footage from the um, Cathedral of Loretto where this long lineup is probably went on for half an hour of lay people up attempting to kiss his hand? Yeah, and He yeah. does that game, psych, psych with this weird little grin. Who would do that? There was no announcement made about his health. And he's the, the Holy Father's concerned about germs. No, nothing. In fact, he, he's selective. Sometimes he'll let um, someone who's uh, a religious brother in a, in a habit. He did permit them to kiss his ring or his hand. Um, that's he's just contrarian. So super, super, that's, but, but why? To what end? To what end? I don't know. How he, is it? He's how a temperamental is it that, man. Everyone knows can, this. Okay, yeah, but that's I, that was my that was my first out to myself because I didn't want I didn't I knew where the evidence spear was going to land it was going to land in Camp uh, Antipope, and I was frankly afraid of where that was going to land because I knew I had no experience. None of us have had any uh, life experience with an antipope, and I identified in my mind antipope with antichrist, and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to get so pummeled if I even start talking about this. Then I learned the definition of antipope. It's simply a man who's falsely believed to be Pope. Doesn't matter if that man is a Latter-day Thomas Aquinas. Doesn't matter how good or bad he is. It's a canonical term about the office holder. And so um, you're gonna have to keep squaring that circle. How is it? That well, wait, no, so you're, you're right. saying, you're just proving to me before you say that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but you're saying you you can't do because like the people your critics will will just somehow dodge being able to hypo, hypo this out. Well, what if what if what if Pat's right? They can't do it. See, I can do both. I could go well. If Pat's right, things are really clean. If he's wrong, then it's just more papal minimalism than we ever even we papal minimalists realized. It seems to be the nature of the magisterium. And we're we're just back to Vatican I. Basically, you only have to listen to the Pope when he's speaking ex cathedra, which is really all Pastora Turna says. And it's more papal minimalism. So I can go either route. Mm -hmm. Your critics can't. They can't go, what if Pat's right? I'm, I just wanted to show to them, because we talk a lot off channel. I wanted to show to them, well, well Pat can do 
this in reverse. He can say, well, what if Francis is Pope? If you say, well, it's an unsquareable circle, because it really could be. The, the, the magisterium will just sort of correct for it and, and say, now nah, more minimalism than you ever thought. The Pope, if, uh, here's what I think. If Pope Francis is really Pope, and, and it can be proven, just, you know, five centuries go by and he's not deposed posthumously, then that's that's proof. They're not going to depose him five centuries later. We won't be around. But again, did you? how would you feel if you didn't have breakfast this morning? Um, well, I can imagine what it'll be like in five centuries. Then all it will mean, what it must mean then, because he's made bigger errors as pontiff than any other pope, is it must be even more papal minimalism, the ontological status of the pontifical magisterium, regardless of who occupies the chair, than even papal minimalists have thought. That's all I move to. That's what uh, well, the Pope really that's... is just, yeah, he's in charge of the other bishops, but it's mainly in terms of discipline and he can really err a little bit more than even I thought. That's all. That's how, that's how I cover that. And it's, it's sticky. It's kind of sticky. Well, uh, that's, I stayed there. I was in that zone for quite some time. Certif certified Pope, but bad Pope. Yeah, I was, that's, that was my I'm not saying that's, there. that doesn't describe, that doesn't describe, uh, an absolute position. I'm just saying that's what, if I could live to be 600 years old, if in situation B, I lived 500 more years and he hasn't been deposed yet, that's descriptively what one must say prescriptively, right? I'm just saying like, can you get hip to that or else, or else you really are claiming like your critics going the other way, you're claiming hundred percent certitude. I'm saying it's, it's not knowable from our point of view. And I can, make the descriptive claim for either side in 500 years what it'll look like, assuming that none of us really know from 500 years back. Have you read much about the formula for papal resignations? I mean, some, some. Yeah, I, I know, all the, I know it, all the talking points. Well, is it, is it possible that someone can not resign the munis or office and still remain pope? Yeah, plausibly. Because if history moves forward and the the cardinals don't invalidate this pontificate, then he was Pope. That's that's one thing I'm I'm prepared to say. It's just there's a contingency to our e ecclesiology that that your critics don't want to acknowledge, and it kind of sounds like you don't want to acknowledge. Like, if l l can you get hip to this much, Pat? If ever if most of the cardinals were of voting age and were Cardinal Burks, then I'd say, we have the votes. We have the votes to do this thing. The day after Francis passes away, he's it, they're gonna they're gonna cadaver synod this guy, you know, because you asked Cardinal Burke yourself. Mm -hmm. But if not, then the way Providence works through our ecclesiology Christology is that. It's one of the contingencies of history. If you have a bunch of liberals in there, then it's also conceivable that even though there was the evidence for uh, cardinal electors to go through and invalidate him, if you don't have the right personnel, which is policy, to go and marshal that evidence thusly, then he'll remain pope. I just want to hear some acknowledgement from you and your critics that you get that. he He'll be pope unless you eventually get the personnel to marshal the evidence. There's clearly enough evidence to take him out. There's more evidence than there was for lots of the anti-popes. That, I, I'm with you. I think there's I think there's certitude about that. But what neither you nor your critics seem to acknowledge is the contingency as to whether or not it's a simple matter of names, dates, and really names and dates. Can you get those cardinals gathered together with the moral courage to say, we're going to do something big here. We haven't had an antipope for quite a while, and we're about to have one. And if there's not that, even if they have the evidence requisite to do it, he's going to be pope, and he'll go forward in history till the end of time as a pope. Well, under that thought experiment, the, and in those conditions, yeah. I just hope the cardinals that were appointed by Pope Benedict and Pope uh, John Paul II find their spine and I stop agree. worrying about travel thinking. What I, I agree. What no one has answered yet is why they think it's possible for someone to remain pope if they do not renounce the office of the papacy. 
That's the kill shot to me. All the Bergoglio stuff is confirmatory. This is the main, this is the bullseye target. If you don't resign according to Canon 332.2 properly, you remain Pope. Irrespective yeah, unless of the, the Cardinals agree events. with you ontological. I mean, that, that's right. a strong, it might be a strong case. I don't know. Well, no, no, cardinal, no cardinal has publicly acknowledged any of this. Some, some bishops have. Uh, Archbishop Lenga of Poland, he doesn't, remember. Believe that, he doesn't believe that Bergoglio has ever been Pope. The first bishop, in fact, I had him on my show five years ago. He's actually, I don't know how his health is now, but Bishop Rene Henry Gracida, the Bishop Emeritus of Corpus, Corpus Christi, Christ. who was a close friend of John Paul II, uh, ordained, I think, by Paul VI, if I'm not mistaken. He was named the first bishop of um, Pensacola, Florida. Uh, still a private pilot at well into his 90s. This is a guy who did 31 bombing raids over Germany as a tail gunner for the U.S. Air Force. If I learned that I had to do one bombing raid over Germany, I would be in the semi-fetal, right? And some mommy, mommy. This guy did 31. So uh, clear thinking man's man. He, he, he was the first bishop I ever encountered um, to talk about the evidence of uh, Bergoglio never having both been elected validly and also uh, Pope Benedict not having resigned validly. So they're, they're out there, but it's the ones that don't have anything to lose, the ones that are either really, really retired or who, have, who are in kind of nothing to lose land. Um, it becomes easier to challenge the status quo if you don't have a position or a Roman villa held over your head. Well, I understand that, but you, I, of course. There, I'm not saying there aren't any out there. I'm saying they don't hold preponderance. Mm -hmm. And That's true. Right now, that's, you're, you're right about that. And, and it's... It's definitely like, look, when you say circular square, I do this a lot as a philosopher. There's something you have called apodictic certitude that there can never be con considered a, a planar figure of 360 degrees that has four, four angles. You know, there's no such thing as a circular square. I have absolute certitude there. Mm -hmm. I don't have when people are like, well, I'm certain that um, we'll get the votes we need. But, you know, to, to, to invalidate the pontificate. I'm, so, I'm apodictically certain. Well, you can't use that term. It means an a priori certitude that mm -hmm. there's something contradictory in the quiddities, the quiddative essences of circle and square. There's nothing near that uh, in terms of the a posteriori certitude that we are going to get, or we, that the Catholics are going to get the votes to invalidate Francis. Now, at, at the level of a posteriori, a posteriori, things you can know. It's not even likely, right? It's not even like, oh, well, it's a posteriori likely that, um, you know, we're not going to get any rain today if if all of the meteorologists agree. We're in the minority, those of us who believe that you're ever going to add to, you know, those cardinals who are seeing reasonable reason, like Langa and uh, Gracida, I don't even know if you're ever going to get a third or a fourth one to, to join that little mafia club. Yeah. Well, I don't know either, Tim. I don't have a crystal ball. And I'm, uh, when I, there's several different ways you can use the word certain, uh, you walk on a 737 and you glance and the guy with the, with the headset on sitting up front seems to be the pilot. Am I certain he's the pilot? Well, yeah, morally certain. Mm, is the surgeon that you uh, have contracted to open you up and, and, you know, perform surgery, is he really the surgeon? There are certain kinds of certainty that you can, uh, you can bet the farm on without having, you know, locked down 100% of all the pistons firing in one direction. I know 99% is good enough. You're 99% sure that guy's the pilot. I, are you 99% sure that they, that we're going to get a bunch of Langas and Gracidas? Cause I'm not, it's not, they're not the uh, same thing. I don't know. I, we've had, there's no historical precedent for this. I know. Um, and time, time's a ticking. Um, because one of the, one, I'll give you two consequences of being an anti-pope. One is not only, not only are magisterial documents null and void, having no, no authority or force, but canonizations and the elevations of cardinals would also be null and void. So if you'll notice, uh, Francis has really aggressively stacked the deck with people made in him, his image and likeness um, to be the electors. And if he's certified, as I think he will be, as an anti-pope, those, those votes don't count. Of course. So th but this is, there's no, we've had no, there's no, to my knowledge, no historical precedent like this 
where there are two claimants that are both still living. Uh, and in the, in, the, in the Avignon papacy, I think it took 70 years to finally have all the dust settle. Uh, in the meantime, Catholics are just going to have to get used to not having that, that subsurface pillar of, of solid ground. Um, and it's disorienting. It was disorienting for the apostles when our Lord took a power nap in the front of the boat. Agree. I mean, these are fishermen who lived and, and lived and died and made their living on the waves. They know what a scary storm is. And that was a scary storm. Agreed. And they even, they even rebuke him. What, can't you see we're going to die here? Someone, yeah, Lord, someone yeah. in the chat said, it just sounds like Tim wants an official pronouncement and Patrick says no need. That's what your comments suggest. I don't think that's what you mean. I think you, uh, you acknowledge that the way the church works contingently is there, mm -hmm. there is a need. There's always a need. It's not that I want it. It's that there needs to be any, I would have zero problem. I would be, I would be kind of psyched if at, the day after he died, they got together and they're like, look, we were cowardly, but there's a bunch of us. We probably have a quorum. Do we have a quorum gentlemen? I'd be like, let's <laughs> go. We're back. That's we, dope. But wouldn't, I that, don't, wouldn't that I, give you goosebumps because that thesis above all fits all the facts? Yeah. Cause it fits By the, the way, facts and it ostensibly the yeah. fits the needs of the church in the world more than anything. But it's wishful thinking <clears throat> from my perspective today. You know, I mean, correct them. You know it requires that. And you know that they're, what we have is not a lot of backbone in the cardinalate or the episcopate. So I just, you're, it ain't you're, a certitude. It's, yes, you're, the commenter is correct. I have never said that I'm the final authority or that we don't need an official certification. Of course we do the magisterium of the Catholic Church must sort out this crisis. It's the worst one since, since the Protestant revolt. Since ever. Because, uh, because yeah. when Catholics love talking about, especially Orthodox conservative Catholics, we love talking about bad popes. We're proud of our, we want like little statuettes of our bad popes because they prove the, the divine foundation of the church because That's Christ true. can, his goodness can overcome the badness of, of the, the few probably half dozen max really bad popes, Borgias and, and Medici popes. But those were corrupt men. Those were manifest sinners. They didn't actively every day try to destroy the deposit of faith itself. They didn't attack yeah. doctrine. They may have bought hookers on Friday and then preached on Sunday. That's the kind of bad pope I can get behind. This right. isn't, we're not, we're, we're, we've left uh, Kansas, uh, Dorothy and Toto. This is not just a badly behaving man. This is a man who is colluded with, with worldly powers that hate the Catholic Church. That's and trying so to I could, reform I me, be, reformable doctrine. Yeah, no, I'm 100% I'm yeah. with everything you just said. 100%. This is new. This is a new level of crisis. I've heard people say it's like the Aryan crisis. You had some, maybe they say up to four out of five bishops that are colluding with heretics and putting forward heresy in their dioceses. This mm -hmm. is the Bishop of Rome. That this is unprecedented. We are not in Kansas anymore. That's why I say we need the epistemic humility. So absolutely, I, it would be amazing <clears throat> if uh, Cardinal, you know, Cardinal Burke told you that. I remember that. If you had 100 Cardinal Burks ready to vote the day after Francis passes on, and then mm -hmm. they, they take that retroactive action. I'm just saying... I didn't, if I were, if we're of, of age in uh, whatever it was, 1984, was it Reagan Mondale? He, Mondale only took Minnesota. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. knew it was going to be a bloodbath beforehand. I don't know how much they knew. I don't know if they knew Reagan would take 49 states, but we're Mondale, man. <laughs> That's all I'm telling you. And mm -hmm. I don't, I don't expect Mondale to overthrow Reagan in 84. I don't expect all of a sudden to have a, but even if you, don't count, even if you discount the Francis bishops and cardinals, which would be a necessity to not beg the question. Yep. I still don't think you have the quorum. Uh, it, you, you might be right. Uh, I think we're dealing with a set of circumstances that has no precedent, uh, except that the fundamental precedent is that uh, Jesus Christ was murdered in front of all his friends and his mother. Murdered. Dead. So our faith is founded on the, on apparent catastrophic failure. Yeah. And it took three days of dead before all of that turned right side up. So that the greatest, you've talked about this in your show more than once, Tim, 
you say it better than I'm about to say it, the greatest evil, not only in history, but that can be performed, was performed on Good Friday, deicide, which resulted in the greatest imaginable good that actually happened at the resurrection, which gave us the possibility of being saved when the, when the whole world was redeemed, although individuals have to cooperate with grace. That's, that battle has already been won. That murder already happened. I like talking about the murder of Christ because I think Catholics, the mental category of crucifixion has been kind of pietized and sentimentalized, like the way our, our crucifixes are very domesticated and kind of softened. I'm talking first degree state murder of an, of an innocent man. And that man was God. And so we can say rightly that God died in the cross. Yeah. And so he has a history of bringing unforeseen life at an unimaginably glorious level from situations that seem intractably dark. And this is how God works in history, bringing good out of evil. My favorite example of this is the patriarch Joseph at the end of the book of Genesis, the guy who is, is the most beautiful uh, prototype of Christ our Lord, right? He was betrayed by his 12 brothers. He's thrown into a well for three days. He's rescued by the Ishmaelites. He ends up being running the house of Potiphar. Potiphar's wife accuses him of sexual assault. He goes in jail where his prophetic powers are, are manifest in the baker and the, and the butler. And then He's the two IC, the second in command under Pharaoh, where he's in charge of bread. Meanwhile, there's a fat, there's a famine in Canaan, and his brothers grovel before this mysterious leader, second in command of Pharaoh, and he knows they don't recognize him. And he's so overwhelmed when he he tests them by planting a silver goblet in the sack of um, uh, Benjamin, and he accuses Benjamin of stealing. And I love that scene. It actually gives me goosebumps just to, to recall it, where Joseph realizes because they've defended the innocent Benjamin, he knows they've all changed their hearts. And he has to leave the room because his sobs fill the whole palace. And then he walks back in and says, I'm Joseph, your brother. And then he says the key line, this is why I'm sharing this little biblical pericope. What you meant for, for evil, God has turned to good. So we are, are going to get a rescue from this. We just have to be patient. We have to stay close to the sacraments. Let me, let me note a subgroup of people that don't believe that Bergoglio is, has ever been Pope. And that is the people who are encouraging Catholics to stay away from mass because the wrong man's name is pronounced in the Te that is That's like the ultimate unforced error. This is the time and the place where we need Jesus Christ the most. We need him in his sacramental Eucharistic presence. We need to be adoring him. We need to be in church more, not less. The idea of boycotting the mass because you think the antipope's name is pronounced is just the worst form of politicizing the Eucharist. This is where, where trads and conservatives say, oh, look, liberals are, are politicizing the Eucharist by pretending to be Catholic, and they make a big deal about proudly going to the altar to receive Holy Communion, as Pelosi, as Biden, as all the, the fake Catholics do. Well, this is another example. I agree. Politicizing the Eucharist. Don't boycott. Don't boycott Jesus because of Judas. I agree. So, and uh, I, I think when you're, you're talking about not identifying as a trad, I don't call myself a trad. I just want to be Catholic plus nothing. I just want to be a disciple. Right. Well, that's a move. Well, we well, this no, conversation goes back five years, where I was yeah. like, I was on Taylor Marshall's channel, and me and you would talk behind the scenes. I'm like, I don't want to be any. I mean, I don't mind being noted as a very conservative Catholic or whatever, because that just means you cleave to the ideas extra much. And, and it, truth be told, there there isn't consensus among all of the billion plus Catholics in the world. So it's honest to do that. But I don't want to be called a, tra you know, a traditional minded Catholic. That's fine. You know, a species of a species. But I don't want to just be called a trad like it's a different religion. And yeah. so many of the trads back in those days wanted to talk about it as a different religion, or some of them explicitly argued that it is a different faith from no disorder of Catholicism. And I was always just like, this is lame. This is lame, and it's actually inaccurate. And um, this did give wind to the sails of the post-trads for four years later, starting about 18 months ago, um, gave them a false wind <clears throat> 
that enables them to, with some pl credibility, plausibility, say, oh, it's really the, the trads who, who'd who made all this. No, 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 no. This was all cooked up at the council when they were cooking up, you know, Bonini's new mass and Paul mm -hmm. VI's new mass. And yes, it's a valid mass because of it's a discipline, not a doctrine. It can change, but it absolutely was cooked up in this bad way that began all the bad stuff. And all of the spirit of Vatican II culminating with Francis is crafted in that exact image of make it tech as valid as, as it can be with the disciplines, but it's just heinously awful. And so the natural law and our natural reason enables us to be like, this is tacky, but I can't say it's invalid. And no one wants to live in that space. I mean, doctrine will either be proven wrong or right. That's binary. But with the, the flavors, the savers of the Catholic Church the last 60 years, where it's just like much of this is just tacky. You can't call me a schismatic just because I'm like, look, this is a tacky song. This is a tacky um, liturgy I was just at mo most Sundays. Uh, and that's all I've ever st I've stayed there. And for the most part, I, I don't like seeing you characterized as one of the binary guys because you agree with me and we've agreed for five years, like just stay in the church again, whether or not um, Vincent Ferris was right because he didn't know at the time or was it Catherine of Siena? Catherine or, of Siena. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or Catherine was right or St. Vincent. They're both saints now. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't matter exactly. This is the ultimate minimalism. It's a white pill. It doesn't really matter who's Pope. I mean, I, that's the ultimate minimalism. His job is just guardian. And I, I'd like to conclude that because I want to bring you to an, another section, but I'll, I'll give you a parting shot on this. I, I sure. ultimately am such a minimalist Technically, I don't think it matters. You just take one shot at that, and then I, I want to ask you the second thing. I wanted to ask you about the most important issue in the church, which is a big point for you, because it was this. Francis, you call him Bergoglio. And we've talked that to death. I'll, but but next, I want to talk about, I think, the most important cultural thing outside the church in the secular culture that's happening. And I, I want to I ask some advice the way I do, usually behind the scenes. But if, if you want to... Okay correct anything or leave a final nugget behind like a well, pet wrap. I, I do. It's, uh, Hmm. I mean, let me put it this way. Um, it does and it doesn't matter who the Pope is in the sense on the one hand, we've had 266. All of them have been sinners. Not all of, all of them have been bad popes or popes who behave badly. Most have been stellar, and many of them are saints. On the other hand, it does matter who this pope is. We need to know who our true spiritual father is, and that is not for me to decide. I am not the final authority. I've never said that I am. We do need official certification. So many people feel like the, 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 the orphans of your, your audience uh, may it grow steadily. They feel this, this orphanness, this sense of being abandoned. And for a while, I, I was in the zone of thinking of Pope Benedict as a coward. Here's my true father. He was weak. He, uh, he, would, he, he moved to Florida, and now he's sending postcards because he would, once in a while, he would collaborate with Cardinal Seurat or he would issue some kind of clarifying statement. I'm like, you know what? I, we have an abusive stepfather because of you, so we don't need your postcards. Amen. That's how I felt at the time. Before I knew anything about the evidence, I didn't know anything about anything about the St. Gallen Mafia. I didn't know the difference between Munist and Ministerium. But um, but fundamentally, we can still walk and chew gum. It's an uncomfortable place to be where you have uh, a more than fifty percent doubt about something, like namely who holds the office of Peter now, and realize that the Church has not been left an orphan. The Holy Spirit is just as active today as as He was last Tuesday, as He was ten years ago, or or 1700 years ago. We're never in a state where we don't have enough grace. Everyone has enough grace to get to heaven and to, to have peace as, as a disciple of Christ today. And I think you mentioned um, Mondale and the, the political analogy. I think Catholics are voting with their feet in being willing to drive extra to go to the traditional Latin mass. It's like they're, they're on an ecclesial level, they're being drawn to blue states. Yeah. No, excuse me, red states. Red states. 
yeah, I was going to let it. Have you, have you and I talked about the red blue thing? Some. The red, okay, so this is another, maybe we can just, it's a quick sidebar because it goes to media and perceptions. When, you, when I think red, and when you think red, what, what political worldview do you think of? What, what political system or structure is identified with red? Communism. Communism. Every communist country has a red flag. Red diaper dober babies, right? Mm -hmm. the, red, the red terror. You think blue, you think blue is, um, there's a joke, uh, it was as ubiquitous as a blue suit at a Tory convention. Blue blood, royalty, stability, Ivy League, conservative. Blue is identified with conservatism. Red is identified with communism. But after, yeah. after well, uh, this is something done, I'm sure, on purpose. If you watch TV coverage, Tom Brokaw in 1976, um, Reagan, who, who lost, and then uh, in 1980, Reagan, who won against Jimmy Carter, they stopped calling blue states blue states. It flipped. Yeah, I remember. So they took advantage of they took advantage of the uh, kind of cognitive dissonance. That's why I kind of um, flubbed it in my mind there. Um, Catholics are hungry for truth. We all are. We're, we're made for the fullness of truth, and I don't think there's anything wrong in preferring the traditional Latin Mass for all the reasons that you talked about, from the musical point of view, which is the least important, to the sense of silent reverence, the healing that comes from just being quiet and being with people who are there intentionally, seeing all the large families. There's a, there's a meta survey done by Father Donald Kloster. Have you heard about this, Tim? K-L-O-S-T-E-R. It compares from six or eight oh, different yes. metrics. Yeah, yes. Novus Ordo Catholic. Well, that's, those are overwhelming numbers. Yeah, they are, and they um, matter. You look at uh, Kenneth Jones wrote a book called Leading in, uh, Index of Leading Catholic Indicators. I first heard about this from Pat Buchanan, who reviewed the book. And it's just the number crunch from 1962 to 2002. We've seen a catastrophic bleed out of the Catholic Church. And uh, Cardinal Supich recently uh, accidentally told the truth when he says, yeah, the Latin Mass shapes people and forms them in ways we don't really want. <laughs> yeah, it does. <clears throat> Correct, Your Eminence. True. Dig. Okay, so, so so endeth the the update from Pat Coffin set of a contest on uh, not not really set of a contism. I'd I'd like to ask you in closing because I I knew this wouldn't take up as much time, but th this isn't your wheelhouse issue. This is my wheelhouse issue. I I just like to ask you because you haven't been on the show much over the last year and a half, once or twice. You used to come on more, and that was literally just because of. Uh, happenstances but i don't know if you've noticed the last eight months in the wider conservative secular conservative culture inclusive of christian cultures in uh christian conservative subcultures in america exploding onto the scene is what's been near and dear to my heart uh, since i announced it on matt frad's show in 2019 that i was writing this patriarchy book mm-hmm what I wanted to ask you, and normally I do this behind the scenes, but I think there's something funny about doing this publicly. What, first off, you know, what do you, what do you think about it? It's, it's all kind of obvious. Pearly things really busted this onto the main, main scene just by being a woman with a YouTube channel who's attacking the abiding feminist ethics and saying pretty much all women, aside from very intentional um, out opters mm -hmm. are pretty much feminists and it's insufferable. You know, she's just always, she started out in last summer, 2023, making the point that feminism is, has made women insufferable, insufferable. And I made this point comically on Matt Frad's show in, I think August of 2019. And it was like kind of funny because Catholics heard it first and, you know, through my my friendship with a lot of these guys behind the scenes, bigger bigger channels than mine, more more secular conservatives, it's become a real talking point. And it, I, I'm so happy that not only are we able to discuss the Pope honestly without people like you or me or Maza or or some people that are more on my side that are reasonable losing their heads, but I love that now the most important issue outside the church 
to the broader world, feminism, can be spoken of. And uh, in some way, Steph says it's like that meme on Lord of the Rings of the, the big troll with the rock head who just goes and knocks down Helm's Deep by running and jumping headfirst into it, and then all of his battalion can come in behind him. In a lot of ways, even though I'm I'm a smaller niche Catholic micro celebrity, as you call it, voice, I did that. And then some of my bigger Catholic friends sort of came in behind and now it's become a national issue. And the red pill people will say, well, we've been talking about this the whole time, but they're not presenting Christian solutions. The true solution is Christian and that's seeping into the main. So mm -hmm. what I was going to ask you is, one, have you noticed it? But two, assuming you have noticed it, is it an instance of, Reagan said, you can accomplish anything in terms of flooding the popular consciousness with truth, as long as you don't insist on getting the credit. She said something just like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. And and now that it's coming into the main, I'm very happy. And um, we'll be releasing a movie in fall of this year. And... It's not that I want credit, but I took a lot of shrapnel in my front side at the beginning. So it's not just like a speech writer that's writing an important speech and gets none of the shrapnel and none of the credit. It's I have a funny kind of view now. You could probably guess what it is. Sometimes I'm like, whoa, whoa, people are citing case for patriarchy. Let's have a chapter verse and page number. What do you think of all this? Do you, do you think that's being petty and... And have you noticed it in general? And is this an instance of just, just listen to Ronald Reagan? We're citing him a lot today. Um, I, I, I like Reagan's um, maxim. Um, I could say the same thing about my book, Sex and Natural, which is now republished. I, I expanded it and revised it after Obamacare in 2015 and 16 and after Obergefell Hodges' decision. And I could, I could say, you know, I, I was... I was talking about humana vitae and where this is all headed toward trans marriage and gay unions before it was cool to do so. I just want people to have the eye-opening experience. I, it doesn't have to be me. I, I, I really don't need the NIH thing, not invented here. Uh, everyone stands on shoulders of someone else. Uh, there are no 100% original insights. They don't exist. There's nothing new under the sun. Creators are crafting pre-existent material. Every painter does it. Every every musician does it. Every songwriter does it. Every poet does it. Um, so the 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 less ego, the the better, because then you're you're pleased when people have an experience where they they realize the answer to feminism is not the manosphere. It's patriarchy. Right. right. And you can just kind of grin to yourself. Have you seen the movie um, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance? No, I haven't seen it. I, I, I might have started watching it. So I'm, I just finished a free ebook. Uh, it's, and it's, a, it's my list of 100 movies that you need to watch before you're allowed to die. And that's, that list is going to be filled out into a full length book. And I highly recommend The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, starring James Stewart and John Wayne. Um, it was directed by John Ford, 1962, I believe. It's one of the last great black and white films. And it's about this guy who performs this heroic act and no one knows about it. Uh, Liberty Valance was the bad guy played by Lee Marvin. And he is shot. But everyone thinks the wrong guy shot him. And the one who did shoot him lived the rest of his life in quiet satisfaction knowing that he did it. And the other one builds a political career on the fact that he didn't do it, but he doesn't correct anybody. It's a mm. really, really magnificent mm. film. So, yeah, you know, just let's just get out of our own way. Um, I'm, I'm about to do an Instagram commentary on the Dale Kearney book, Carnegie book, how to win friends and influence people. Terrific book, not a well-named book. It's not, it sounds a bit scammy. Like you're trying to slime people and influence them and sell them things they don't need. It's more about the, the hidden power of kindness that people, people need affirmation. They don't need flattery. It's not about lay layering butter and flattery. It's about appreciating them and getting them to to see that you you want to help them get what they want and it doesn't have to be me convincing you that uh, now you're you're adopting my position um i think certain folks in the stratosphere love shooting on others they just should all over them they should over others like you have to think my way this should is should on your shoes time. man yeah right so um yeah i think your your thesis in the case for patriarchy is being vindicated again and again because it's it's both the antidote to feminism 
and to the manosphere. And this is the distinction that I would make. It's not with me. I Heaven help me. I have a thousand weaknesses. One of them is not failures of magnanimity. I don't have to have the credit. I, I guess the, the other, the missing half of what I'm, I'm feeling now is that now that the, the conversation has erupted onto the popular scene, it is being commandeered by a false Hegelian dialectic between red pill versus trad cons really means feminist conservatives and both of them are wrong and patriarchy is the sl solution to both and it, we haven't achieved critical mass as they say in terms of convincing the popular mind or even getting it out on popular media that mm -hmm. the solution is not trad con what they call trad con feminist conservatism no that's mm -hmm. wrong Red pill is wrong. That it hasn't achieved where what it needs to achieve the high ground yet. That it's patriot Christian patriarchy, and patriarchy is required by Roman Catholicism. So that's why I'm like, okay, this is this is where this space. I'm glad that the the pieces are ready on the, for the board to achieve the win. Mm -hmm. That's why we're, we're we're making this movie. What a woman is because people are still saying it wrong. It would be one thing if everyone was sort of getting it right and you have this conservative eureka moment everyone uh, achieves in the Hegelian phenomenology of Geist. Everyone gets it at once, but that hasn't happened. It's just we've gotten a couple steps closer to people being ready to hear it. They're attuned to it. And so now fall of 2024, well, what a woman is, uh, is going to break all of that apart and bring a bunch of people home. Don't, don't listen to the red pill. It tends to be Jewish Muslim. All the influencers are Jewish or Muslim. They're 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 calling apostatized, angry Christian white men away from the faith of their fathers. And I'm just saying, come back to the faith of your fathers. Your fathers probably taught you wrongly uh, uh, some feminist, crypto feminist version of it. The true faith mm -hmm. of your fathers is the solution. So I guess there's still space for me. But um, I, the, you know, maybe that's well, what I'm. You your, your efforts will be hobbled because the Argentine now living in Rome is completely opposed to your thesis. I know. He wants to feminize. He thinks Christianity is too masculine. Demasculinize it. Demasculinize it, right. Sm um, <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I, I know you're, you're a good observer of trends. Um, did, can we, did you want to just, okay, a couple things, and this has to be in closing. One, you got me on the theme of mimesis. Mm -hmm. How... And I'm I'm interested if you could apply um, this philosophy of mimetic desire. It's a, it's it's a it's a phenomenon, not a philosophy. Mm -hmm. Phenomenon of mimetic desire. Yep. To what I'm saying, um, two years, let's say four years ago, when I went on Matt Fred's show, and I was like, "Look, I'm I'm not I don't care about what's being called dysphoria. You know, a guy thinks he's a woman that have, that that affects." fewer than one in a thousand. What I care about that affects 999 out of every thousand Catholic households I see, and it's probably worse in other demographics, is women that act like the husband and husbands that act like the wives. And I'm, I told Matt, I was just at Disney World yesterday, man. I saw a bunch of angry, bitter, ungrateful, I'm going to be honest, chubby wives, the average weight of woman in America's 170 pounds 0.5. Did you know that? I was not I wrong. It used no. to be 123 pounds in 1954. Now it is 170.5, which mm -hmm. is a lot for a woman. Um, and there's there's something something to physiognomy. They're throwing their weight around. They're throwing fits. There's a current uh, RBF scowl. And it's, it's chubby. And I, I think I even shared what Steph said when we saw one particular fit on our way back to our car in the parking lot at Disney World. Um, this lady's throwing a fit over a Diet Coke. She's not cute enough to pull this off. And neither are any of the other fit throwers that we'd <clears> seen <throat> all three days, multiple times per day. This seems to be widespread. And the so mimetically speaking, maybe you can explain what it is by example. The, what's caught over the last four years, particularly the last two, is people have gotten that this is really icky, the way women are acting popularly. But mimetically, right now, 
they seem to have glommed onto the, 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 the popular people, the popular listeners out there seem to have glommed onto the wrong solution for it, corrective for it, which seems to be, uh, it's either red pill or this kind of feminism stuff. And I'm just wondering how can you use this philo this phenomenology of mimetic desire to start a wave, you know, to start the wave toward the truth. And why does mimetic desire so frequently cut against the truth? The truth is on our side. Mm -hmm. We're saying that the corrective here is Christian patriarchy, but it seems to be harder to make catch than either of these false positions, red pill or feminism. Mm -hmm. so, so talk about mimetic desire. I know you get it from um, Rene Girard, right? Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, there's a lot there. Let me just maybe open the aperture to talk about what it is and how it applies to everything as communicators, as disciples, as people who want to tell the truth and act in the light of the truth. Um, Rene Girard, French born um, literature professor. I suppose you could say he's a philosopher, but a philosopher of literature, literature uh, taught at Stanford for the last 40 years of his life. He, he was his sweet spot was the great novels and the commonalities of the great novels. And I learned everything I know about mimesis from him and from uh, an author named Luke Burgess, B-U-R-G-I-S. Luke has a book called Wanting. Um, I think it's called, I think the subtitle is um, Mimetic Desire in Everyday Life, something like that. And mm. mimesis or mimetic desire, it's a, it's a phrase he coined. It's a workable theory of human nature that says that we are made to love what others love and hate what they hate. We get on bandwagons. We are attracted to fads. We like trends. We like being part of the in crowd. We don't like to stand out. There's been a lot of studies on jury selection. Mm -hmm. And when you get people in a room who have been um, subject to an experiment, like someone who's an actor has stolen a purse from another person who's an actor, when, when law enforcement, who are psychologists studying the people, get them in a room, if, so, if one person is convicted that the guy had a green jacket, even though you see in the video it was a red jacket, the people who know otherwise, they will succumb to the group. Groupthink is a very powerful impulse. It's mimesis is at the heart of the Stanley Milgram experiments from 1962 and Yale, you know about those where people were, mm -hmm. uh, well, Stanley Milgram decided he was very obsessed with, with the German population in uh, Nazi Germany. And uh, as a, an American Jew who is a, an observer of human nature, he wanted to understand how did the Third Reich happen? Did it happen in a vacuum? Are there something, is there something really bad about Germans per se? So he devised an experiment uh, near, uh, in, New, in New Haven, near, near Yale. And there were two groups, learners and teachers. And the learners were actually actors. They were paid actors. And the teachers were the subjects of the experiment. And they were, the, the learners were put into a, a booth not too far from the, uh, the teacher. And the teacher had a series of questions to ask them. And built into the questions were the wrong answers. And the teacher was encouraged by Dr. Milgram and his associates. They were wearing white uh, jackets and they had stethoscopes and they had important looking um, uh, clipboards. They administered a punishment in the form of an electric zap. And you can hear the guy going, ow, ow, ow. And the, the teacher's like, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to do this. Oh, no, the, re, the experiment requires that you do it. I take full responsibility. You signed a waiver. We're paying you. So the dosage of electrical shock went up, 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 to the point where the people are writhing and screaming every time the wrong answer zap is given to them. After, I don't know, 400 volts, I'm probably getting the number wrong. There's an XXX number. And that when the, when, the learn, when the teacher hit that button to punish the learner for getting the answer wrong, there was no silence. There was silence. What do you think the percentage is of teachers succumb to the peer pressure by the doctor that administered the fatal dose? What percentage do you think? Hmm. I don't know. High? 63. Hmm. So Milgram didn't have to go to Germany to do this study because he's dealing with human nature. We are prone to obeying authority. We are prone to what the, the tribe thinks. And this is why it's better to be based than to be conservative. Because when you're based, your primary lenses are true, false, good, evil, come what may. You want to get you and your, and your family to heaven. 
and you don't really care about what the tribe thinks about what that ought to look like. You really have to be truly independent of tribal thinking and dependent only on, on Jesus Christ and what he reveals. Rene Girard gave a, a really interesting interview a few years ago before he passed away. May he rest in peace. And it's on the, the denial of Peter. And I believe it's Luke's gospel that, that calls her a young maid or a young maiden. So there's Peter, who spent mm. three years of his life with the light of the world, now warming himself by an earthly light, the fire, right? He's trying to stay warm. And uh, this girl says, hey, weren't you with uh, Jesus of Nazareth, the one who was arrested? And then Peter tries to ignore her. And Gerard's point is that that detail that St. Luke gives, that it's a young maiden, is, is a point of mimesis, because she's not an old crone. It's not an old hag. It's a young maiden. Subliminally, that means attractive young woman. Someone whose opinion is going to sway the opinion of others. Peter knows this, which is why he now starts to emphatically deny that he knew Christ. No, I don't know. I don't, I don't know the man. Oh, yeah, yeah, she says. I recognize your accent. And then he draws curses upon himself, and then he hears the cock crowing, and he, he cries bitter tears. The idea that the, the girl was young and therefore had influence set up a groupthink situation that became more and more threatening to Peter because he did not want to suffer what he did with, with, uh, alongside Jesus, which only days before he promised to do so. Remember that? I will die for you. I'll go to jail for you. And then this, uh, this attractive young uh, woman outs him as a coward. Yeah, and so he's, he's desiring to, to lie because of, uh, just to strip it down to its bare parts, mm -hmm. because of the mimetic desire here, there's a really immediate consequence. He knows he might go to, he might follow his Lord to the cross. But mm -hmm. the the wider point that I'm sure Gerard wants to draw forth is that that temptation is always there, even what minus the immediate consequence of the. Oh, cross. it is. Yeah, you don't need the threat of arrest to have mimesis. Look at the right. remember the ice bucket challenge from I think 2015. Where yep. people like threw uh, absurdly, you know, buckets of ice water allegedly to raise money for ALS. That didn't raise, that didn't move the needle at all on ALS research. No. But it made millions of people feel good about themselves because they joined this, this parade of mimetic desire, this, this bandwagon. Yeah. Now, why would ordinarily smart adults uh, um, bring sleeping bags on street corners to wait for a movie to open? Well, because now it's a news thing. I think the first one... The first movie to do that was Phantom Menace, mm -hmm. the uh, Star Trek franchises. Star Wars. And, uh, st so Star what did Wars. I say? Yeah, Star Wars, right. Um, no one would do that for Star Trek. Long, long, that's true. Um, or should they? Long, long, long sneaking lines for, for Black Friday. This is, these are all mimesis. Um, I think tattoos are an example of mimetic desire or wanting to, to seem cool like you, you want to brand yourself. I think that you can see the, the, the spread of the internet uh, equals the rise of the tattoo movement to, to brand yourself as we become less and less incarnate and more discarnate because we've redefined friendship through Facebook and we've, we've stopped hearing each other's voice through texts. There's like this need to get back to the, to the flesh, to, the, to the, the solidity of the incarnation. And um, ultimately, we, we're prone to, to, to thinking with the tribe. Um, I'll give you one more experiment. It's a, it's a, there are cameras in an optician's office and the, the people who are there as waiting to go in and see the doctor are all paid actors, just pretending to be patients. And at one point, they're all waiting and you can, the reception's also in on it. And everyone stands up for no reason and they look straight ahead for about five seconds and they sit down. And this one woman, a young Asian woman, she's like, this is weird. And then the next person goes to the doctor and then, then a new person arrives and then everyone stands. Well, the girl stands just because she didn't want to be the only one in the room, not standing. And then at some point they keep the door open for, uh, uh, actual, you know, strangers to come in who are not actors. And that, that pattern of standing absurdly for no particular reason catches on because of mimesis. You can, you can, I don't know what it's called on the internet, but you can watch it on YouTube. It's pretty, pretty fascinating. And I think mimesis is deadly to apologize uh, to uh, evangelization because you, you, our Lord and savior gave us the blueprint in the fine print of our baptismal certificates. 
If the world hates me, it's going to hate you. That's not a Hebraic hyperbole. Disciples are hated because Christ was hated. Read John's gospel. They, starting after the wedding at Cana, this gnashing of teeth hatred comes. And we just have to accept this is part of the deal, that to, to but, lose your life is gaining it. Have, I agree with all that, and I, I was learning, hearing it, and I, I only knew a little bit about mimetic desire before, but how can we implement it in a way that befits us? It seems so rare, but think of like the Bud Light mimetic desire. Think of all the mm -hmm. awful companies that have be spoiled and besmirched this once great nation over the last 10, 20 years. I wanted all of them to get punished at, at the behest of the Vox Populi and, and hit in the pocketbook the way Bud Light did. And Bud Light did something that, yeah, it's obnoxious. But I don't know what the magic tone was in the air that made all the dummy beer light beer swilling dummies out there go i'm not gonna buy bud light and until you achieve critical mass once again that's where the mystery in here's once you have critical mass and all the dummies aristotle says most men lead apolostic lives life's fit for cattle but they have this social nature unlike cattle where they the, the combination of them just means that 90% of people just live according to mimetic desire mm -hmm. in, in a way that's easy and pleasurable and is the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. So I don't get once mimetic desire kicks in at the level of the popular consciousness that whatever that viewpoint is, is going to preponderate like a snap. But how do you get more good stuff? Like the Bud Light phenomenon was good stuff to become mimetic. I, I mean, I, if you knew this, then both of us would probably be multi-billionaires and we'd be having this convo, you know, on a, on a beach sometime, somewhere drinking Muay Thais, hanging out with my family and owning hotels. But what do you think about, yeah, I want to I want to weaponize mimetic desire to make sure that um, <coughs> the, the pushback on feminism doesn't get commandeered by Red pill, another wrong idea. It's actually a, a kind of feminism that's the corrective to feminism. And it seems to be a containment mechanism. I want to use mimetic desire to make sure this doesn't happen. And I, I simply don't know how to do it. The ones who are holding everybody's leashes seem to be the only one able to weaponize it to their benefit. Do you have any clues there? I think the clue lies in how small a proportion of the population is required to have this revolution and this this uh, critical mass shift. A lot of Marine Corps uh, uh, professionals in, in the Marines have a, a tattoo that says 3%. You see various versions of this 3%. Now, I'm mm -hmm. not a historian, but I understand that only about 3% of the, of the colonists in the colonies were willing to take up arms against the, the mighty British military machine. But 3% was sufficient because 3% provides enough of a mimetic model for, for people who may be on the fence. Right. If 3% of people walking onto a Boeing 737 said, yeah, I'm not wearing a mask, that would be the end of the COVID mask mania. Adults to this day are still willingly impeding their breathing for a scam. So yeah, Jesus calls us sheep. We are prone to mimetic imitation. We love office gossip. We love scapegoating, which becomes, it becomes very important to pick your spouse well and to pick the five people around you well, that they're truly like-minded. And by like-minded, I don't mean rubber stamping everything you say. And by that, I don't mean people who are not going to challenge you. I mean, people who are going to call you to account to stick to the principles that you say are yours. So you can use mimetic desire in, in a jujitsu move on your behalf, as long as you're you realize that you're encouraged to do so by people who really care about you. The people who, you know, I call them 5 a.m. friends. If, if, you're, if the wheels of your life fall off at 5 a.m. and you can call them, then that's a true friend. Agreed. I think we have, I think people have dozens and dozens of, of uh, associates and, and um, acquaintances, but they're not, they don't really pass the true friendship test. Agreed. Agreed. Well, Patrick David Coffin, you are a true friend to me and to Steph and to the show. And you've been there for us through thick and thin, and we appreciate it. And you are a 5 a.m. friend. Sounds a little bit 
a little bit uh, light in the loafers, but I like it. You're a 5 a.m. friend. And um, well, at least I at least I'm sober, unlike some people I know at 5 a.m. <laughs> well, one thing we, we, we got to end this. I think that was a great, great segment on the Mesas. And uh, I think it was well applied. So thank you for that. Can you tell us a um, quick little update on yep. your pilgrimage with Bishop Strickland uh, at the yes, end of May, uh, end, of, end of spring? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. Uh, I'm I'm relaunching Coffin Nation soon. The main Good. hub is patrickcoffin.media. If you go to patrickcoffin.media slash pilgrimage, we're going to France for nine days. If you can see that with Bishop Strickland, the Bishop Emeritus of Tyler, Texas, another uh, object of canceling by the powers that be inside the church. Um, a gentle man, a uh, man of prayer. We are not going to be talking about church politics on this pilgrimage. We are not going to be talking about uh, all of the uh, all the the points of pain and confusion and chaos and uh, scandal. We're going to be talking about being a Catholic, uh, being made holy by sights. We're going to be starting in Lisieux. We're going to see. I love saying Rouen, where Joan of Arc uh, was killed. Talk about suffering because of the church, right? Joan of Arc. Yep. Um, we're going to Nevers to see the incorrupt body of St. Bernadette. We're going to Toulouse to pray at the tomb of St. Thomas Aquinas, ending in uh, Lourdes. There's also a, I've never been to Lourdes. I can't wait to get there. Um, we're also doing a pre-pilgrimage trip to Fatima. And we'll be there from May, we're leaving May 11th. We'll be there for the May 13th anniversary of the first apparition of the, uh, Our Lady of Fatima. Um, and we'd love to have you aboard. Um, just tell tell our our call rep that you heard about it in Tim Gordon's Rules for Retrogrades, and um, we're offering a 10% discount for the first two weeks of Lent. So if you want to save 10% on that, we were going to have an, an, another leg to Spain, but we decided to streamline and go essentialist and stick to Fatima, Portugal, and uh, France. Uh, France, there's a good reason why France is called the eldest daughter of the church. Some of the greatest saints in church history are buried there and it's a it's a time to renew your faith and, and kind of reset and recharge so that um site yeah i don't know if you have a, a link there tim but it's patrickcoffin.media slash pilgrimage tell them tim the gordon sent you get that discount tim tim the gordon um uh yeah amazing amazing people go do this we were getting a lot of interest when we first mentioned it about three weeks ago and what a great thing to do in 2024 in the first half of the year beautiful beautiful uh patrick yep. david coffin thanks thanks for appearing with me today i, I just wanted to play you mentioned bishop strickland who's going to be accompanying you guys mm -hmm. uh, you helped to set this up you know i i talked to bishop strickland a little bit but not as much as you um here, here's here's what he said uh, on the day of my 50,000 subscriber show. You ready to hear this? Hey, mm -hmm. Stephanie, this is Bishop Strickland. Just wanted to congratulate you on reaching 50,000 subscribers. Uh, God bless and take care of yourselves. Super cool. cool. Right There yeah. it is. Yeah. yeah. I love the guy. I, I, I know he's, you. Uh, he's going to be vindicated as one of the greats. And when the, the history of the church in America, he's going to be in the, in the first chapter. Uh, as a witness to the deposit of faith and in a very humble way that is not in any way uh, attention seeking or um, uh, ego driven, just a servant who is uh, willing to, to, to pay the cost. You and I talked about cost. Cost is, that's, the, that's what's the cost of discipleship. That's the Dietrich von uh, the Bonhoeffer book. It's an important thing to think about. Are you willing to pay the cost? Because the cost will come and it's always worth it because Jesus is Lord. He's not forgotten us and he loves us and there's nothing we can do about it. Des Volt. Thanks, Des Pat. Volt, Tim. God bless you, man. Thanks for the, the time and the platform. Always enjoyable to chat with you on or off the air. You too. You too, brother. All right, people, uh, go go find the, the reinvigorated uh, Coffin Nation shortly. And if you have the time, sign up for Pat's Bishop Strickland-led uh uh, a journey, a sojourn back to the motherland. God bless you all.